Valley Unitarian Fellowship. Um, if you are here for the first time, special welcome. If you're returning, we're glad to see you. If you have questions at any time, just ask somebody who's wearing the name tag. If I'm not. Um, <laughs> and um, let's see, we have special um, program today. Who am I? I am Barbara Hume. I'm Barbara Hume. And um, on the uh, worship committee for the fellowship. So, our welcoming slides. Yep. Okay. So we welcome you to the Comox Valley Fellowship. We are have just celebrated our 60th anniversary year. And we welcome you, whoever you are, whatever your age, whatever your race, whatever you believe, whatever your faith or philosophy, whatever your background, your identity or orientation, you are welcome here. For thousands of years, indigenous people occupied this shoreline and uh, referred to it as the land of plenty. And we acknowledge that we meet here on the traditional territory of the Pentlatch, the Aixan, and the Comox First Nations. We have the privilege of having Aaron Morton with us. Aaron is our new minister. And this is what Aaron had to say about his journey to get here. Aaron's journey towards minister ministry began in Toronto in 2016, where he got the call and shortly afterwards enrolled in cemetery, this seminary, <laughs> cemetery, <laughs> seminary, <laughs> and they've got a number of surprising <laughs> challenges along the way. Oh, there have been a number of surprising challenges along the way, um, including global pandemic and an attack by a scorpion. But overall, he says the path has been one of deepening spiritual growth, fantastic mentors and colleagues, and learning in unexpected places. He's of delight, and he is delighted to begin the next chapter of his journey here with us as our new minister. 
Aaron. Hello, everybody. Um, I got to start with the chalice lighting, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, um, Satya, would you mind lighting the chalice while I say the words? Would you be okay to do that? Um, so, why we're here? We are here in this place with these people. May we listen so we hear. May we hear so we can feel. May we feel so we can know. And may we know so we can change ourselves and this world. May we light, may this chalice we light, light our way. Thank you. So, as you know, I'm Aaron. I'm your new minister. And I've heard that most of you don't know anything or very much about me at all. So I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you a few things. But if I don't answer all your questions, don't worry. We're going to gather at those cozy seats at the back after the service, and you can grill me on anything you need to know. <laughs> the first thing you should know about me is that I'm Scottish. And if you don't already know, the national animal of Scotland is the unicorn. <laughs> And the national flower of Scotland is the thistle. I like to think this is representative of me being a practical idealist that can see the beauty in unexpected places. Other people have different interpretations, so you can make up your own mind as we get to know each other. I spent the first 20 years of my life in Scotland and the next 10 in Dublin, Ireland, and I arrived in Canada in 2003, in ECF first in the Sunshine Coast and Vancouver. And then I spent a year in Montreal and then eight years in Toronto, at least five of them plotting my escape. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved back to Victoria in 2016. While some folks in this part of the world question my going east, it was important because <laughs> I met my partner in Montreal and I found my call to Unitarian Universalism in Toronto. But now I'm happy to be back here by the ocean. <laughs> when I was in Toronto, I did a Master's of Environmental Studies at York University, and my concentration was in love as praxis, or love-based community building. I started the degree program because I'd become disillusioned with my work in the not-for-profit field. I'd worked in community organizations my whole life and had come to the realization that the, the change that I wanted to make wasn't possible in those organizations. And I needed to know another way to work. I needed to find out another way to work. So I enrolled in grad school. <laughs> so socially acceptable way to figure things out, apparently. <laughs> um, so and this degree became my playground. I did lots of experimentation. And as it turns out, as I went along, my program became more and more about spirituality. And there was only one other person in the program at that time who had a focus on spirituality. And it turns out he was a UU. And when I told him about my program, he was like, oh my goodness, you're a UU. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, and he was like, yeah, you are. And you need to go to neighborhood congregation in Toronto. Um, well, I was working, I was in school, I had, I was fostering a kid, I had a lot of things going on. So I didn't go for a couple of years. And then finally, I went there, as I was getting close to leaving Toronto. And what do you know, he was right. <laughs> so, um, when I was at York, I was also a humanist official. And so at that time, I went to neighborhood, I had finished my um, schoolwork, I had quit my job. But I had a whole bunch of weddings I had to do before I could leave. And that's when I went to the UU congregation. And uh, I got my call to ministry pretty quickly after going there, which I found terrifying <laughs> and very confusing. And I had this very stereotypical idea in my head of what a minister was, and it was not me. <laughs> and yet I had this very, very strong calling and I needed to follow it. 
And so I did, even though um, I was really not sure about it to begin with. And uh, as soon as I committed to it, everything fell into place. Within a couple of months, I was in seminary. I attend Cherry Hill Seminary, which is a pagan sermon seminary going on in North America. And so my Masters of Divinity is focused on earth-based spirituality. And um, my journey to seminary has been slow and steady. I started in 2016. I'm still working on it. And um, it's really been actually a great way to do it because I needed to integrate, um, first of all, this idea of me being a minister. And then all these uh, ideas have really integrated into my personal life during that time. I have, uh, I fell in love and started dating my best friend. I moved across the country with her. We recently adopted a child. And so it's woven through all of these things and also through my professional life, of course, as well. When I got a job as the director of spiritual exploration and learning in Victoria, um, where I've been for the last four years. Um, and so it was great to be there while in seminary and test out all the ideas and have, have a place that was supportive and encouraging. Um, so my past work in not-for-profits has definitely, and my role in spirit, as a DRE, or spiritual exploration, has very much um, influenced my approach to ministry. I definitely take a family or multi-generational approach and think one of the many advantages that churches can offer is spaces for healthy intergenerational connections. I know this congregation has had issues with a significant drop of families and kids coming. And uh, during the pandemic, that has happened across the board, all of North America that is not unique here. But I really um, look forward to working with Caroline and the congregation to figure out ways to re-engage families and kids as we start to move out of the pandemic. Hopefully, we're moving out of the pandemic. Um, and I've heard a lot about your commitment to environmental justice um, and look forward to learning about that and some of the issues of concern in this community. And I'm really glad to be here today with Watershed being here to learn more there. And I'm super excited about the new work around when in the circle and the eighth principle and looking at what compassionate action it calls us to take as we transform ourselves and the world. How will this impact our congregation? So um, in summary, you won't find me to be the stereotypical old school minister I referred to later uh, earlier. That is most definitely not me. What you will find is a partner to collaborate with. When we work towards the, the uh, mission of this fellowship, both in the caring and in the work of transformation. I am creative and flexible, and I will support you to the best of my ability as we move into this post-pandemic life, whatever that's gonna look like. We are facing many challenges as we think about the future of Unitarian Universalists, both in a local and in a continental level. And we know the church cannot be what it used to be. It won't survive. And we don't yet, yet know what it's gonna become. In the coming years, I'm delighted to work with you to explore creative approaches to, you, uh, to support you in your journey to find out what this means for this fellowship and to see what we can co-create together. Thank you. Thank you, um, because we have a, a guest speaker today, we're going to do the joys and concerns with just one stone. Normally, we ask people to think of the joys and concerns in their heart. We put a stone in for each. But to shorten that time, we're just going to put one in. I ask you to think, take some time, a couple of deep breaths, and think about those joys and concerns that are in your heart and in your mind now. We'll put one stone in and know that you are not alone in joys and concerns.
we are uh, uh, gifted with having Kayla from the Project Watershed to speak with us today. She's been here before, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so many people are familiar with it because they've driven past it on the coming off the bridge on the Comox Highway. And very exciting changes lately. So Kayla is the director of finance, manager of fundraising and outreach and mapping. So she's going to share with us some things. Then she will stay for some questions and answers so we can understand that what's happening over there. It's all very exciting. Kayla. Can I, can I ask you to take your mask off? I can't understand. Okay. I can't understand. Perfect. Anybody? Okay. I'm really okay, sorry. we'll try. Thank you, Murray. I'm sorry to interrupt, Kayla, yeah. but um, we need to take the kids out now just before okay. you start. So I'll get the kids to head off now. Okay. okay. Be sure to bring them back. <laughs> 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 Okay. Yeah, I might just go a little bit up like this so I can see what my slides are doing. Excellent. Hello. Thank you so much for having me here. I really enjoy giving presentations like this and filling our community in on what's going on. There's a lot going on um, in our organization and also in this project. So this project um, we feel is um, a restoration project, but it's also a reconciliation project. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. So Project Watershed, we um, work under the umbrella of keeping it living, which comes from a Kuala word, which is kwakwalakwa. And this is the principle where we all make our environment better. We don't just do no harm, but actually every time we interact with it, we make it, we improve it. So having a long-term benef mutually beneficial relationship with it. And that has pushed us to do a lot of different things. Um, back in about 2009, we started looking really at our estuary. <clears throat> and this is an estuary here. It's our estuary. It's a, one of the largest estuaries on the coast. Estuaries are extremely important habitats. Out of um, <clears throat> There are 300 actually on the coast of BC, but out of the amount of shoreline that we have is actually quite a small number. Um, and it, over 80% of the marine creatures in, on the north coast, um, on the coast here, utilize estuaries. So there's not very many of them, but they're super important um, places for, for plants and animals. Um, it's a class one estuary. Only um, eight of those 300 estuaries that I mentioned, only eight are considered class one. And so Ducks Unlimited did a ranking of estuaries and ours came out as a class one. The Fraser River is another class one estuary. Um, it has to do with the size of the estuary. Ours is quite large, all the way from Goose Spit all the way around um, to the air park and then out again to tr the Trent River estuary. So it's quite expansive that way. Also, we have a lot of herring spawn here, and that was another um, factor. And birds. We have over 70,000 different birds that utilize our estuary. It's, an important, it's within an important bird area. So it's extremely productive, and, and it's a class one estuary. Next. It's also a major carbon sink. So we've got, I've got two pictures here. Maybe you've been to Cathedral Grove. Um, so we've got our big, large trees in Cathedral Grove, and we've got our small plants in the estuary. And for a long time, most people thought that our big trees were our major carbon sequesters. And lately we've discovered that our small estuarine plants are actually super great at sequestering carbon. And this is because they grow so fast. So we know that uh, our larger trees, they grow very slowly and they're only adding, their, their biomass is only getting so much bigger every year, whereas our small estuarine plants are growing super fast. And every time they grow, they sequester carbon. So our estuary is actually a major carbon sink, which is important in these times when we're looking at the effects of climate change. So a lot of what we do when we're talking about our, our saltmark grasses, our eelgrass and our kelp, those are all carbon sequesters. And they don't just take the carbon out like trees do. <clears throat> when they die, they either go out to the deep ocean and sink down, or they get put back up on shore and get buried. Um, and so basically that carbon is out of the atmosphere forever <clears throat> and, and never gets re-released. 
So as I said, they're very rare, yet very important. I said this so we can we can go go past this one. There's some great photos. I just love the photos. Yeah. <laughs> stay there, right? Um, so one of the things that we looked at when we looked at the estuary is all the different ways that we could help it be more productive. So it was one of the most productive estuaries we figure um, back in pre-settlement times. And so all those marks are different projects that we, we wanted to do in different areas. And um, so there was a lot of them. And we're looking at the estuary as a whole picture, which is interesting because our estuary is divided up into many governmental agencies. Um, there's the city of Comox, there's the um, the city of Courtney, the town of Comox, the CBRD, Ministry of Transportation. <laughs> and so there's a lot of different jurisdictions that this one body um, falls under. And so it gets managed in a variety of different ways. And one of the things that we realize is we have to, you know, overall that we're trying to work towards is getting all these different players on the same page. So they're working towards the same goals within this footprint. And then uh, one of those places that we pinpointed um, was the field sawmill site. So this is a photo from the 1940s, late 1940s. And it's when the sawmill had moved to the estuary. So in, uh, I think it was 1948 or nine, field sawmill moved from Arden Road down to the estuary. This is a great place for a sawmill being on the side of a river. It's very easy for the logs to come down from the upper watersheds and no trucks needed. And then they can be processed at this facility and shipped out again quite easily. So it was a great place for the sawmill. Next slide. Oh, we're going backwards. <laughs> there we go. Excellent. And so eventually, over the years, so since the 1940s, it developed and got bigger and larger and more productive and um, built up and up until we, we reached what was a peak production, um, which was probably sometime in the late mm, early 80s, they figured. And uh, after that, so this was very productive. It employed a lot of people here in the Comox Valley. It was kind of the center of a lot of things. But then in 2000, 2004, it shut down. Interfor, who was the last owners of the property, shut down the, the sawmill and started taking away all the things on it and um, getting it ready for, to put up for sale, which they did in 2006. No, no, we're good. We're good. Um, so this uh, is what it has looked like since 2006, which is quite a long time. And there are a couple different ideas about what we could do at this site. Um, there were some developers who wanted to put condominiums there and other, other such things. And uh, from an environmental perspective, we know that an estuary is super rare and super important. And this being a part of that ecosystem is also an important place. It's a tidally influenced area. Um, and it's super important for salmon specifically, other creatures as well, but the salmon that go up to the Puntledge or the Browns, they both need to pass by this location twice when they're going out as juveniles and then back up again as adults, right? And it became known as the killing wall because um, seals who are quite smart realized that what they could do is they could herd the salmon and they would they'd take their baby seals and they place them right along the, the top of the water along the wall. And then the mother seals would dive under the water and they'd scare the salmon towards the wall. And the wall, if you can see, has these little divots in it. And when the salmon get close to those divots, um, it, they almost act as blinders. And so they wouldn't, they would be, they would not want to turn so much and they go straight up the wall, right into the mouths of the baby seals that are waiting wow. at the top. So extremely effective for seals to um, predate on salmon, but not great for our salmon stocks. And as you might know, this is one of the main thoroughway, thoroughfares for our salmon to get up to the upper watersheds. So we saw this and like, you know, this is not great habitat and it could be amazing habitat. The group of trees that is down there, that's known as Hollyhock Flats. It has been preserved. Um, they were going to down farther. Yeah, back right down there, perfect. So that's the Hollyhock Flats area, it's the marshy, boggy area. And then there's the dike slough that comes in through that area. So that is extremely productive. In fact, when we were surveying salmon in different areas, we found that that had the highest amount of salmon fry. So we know it was super important habitat. And these off-channel habitats are really important. When salmon come down the river, they actually have to change, um, acclimate so that they can be so they can function well in a saltwater environment because they're going from a freshwater river or lake 
and they need to change their bodies so that they can survive out, out in the ocean. And so places like estuaries are super important for those salmon. So they have time to slowly change and be able to, to work with um, the salt water. So we saw this, you know, you know I think we could, we could do something here. And we talked among each other and uh, other environmental groups and people in the public and people were very supportive to be doing something with this site. Turn the slide. And so we thought, you know what, we have, we have a vision where this could become part of the estuary and this could really help support salmon stocks. Um, it could also help mitigate flooding. So the, the buildings on the other side experience a lot of flooding at different times. That wall um, pushes the floodwaters when there's lots of water coming down or maybe a high tide coming in. It pushes all that water to the other side and floods out those, those areas. So we thought, you know, this would be good for us. It would be good for um, the ecosystem. Let's think about this. And at that time, we had someone come on our board, Tim Ennis, who had done this in Campbell River. So he had taken Bakey Slough, which had been a log sort um, and just littered with um, years and years of um, bark and all that kind of stuff that comes off the logs. And he killed the habitat within the estuary up there. And they spent $10 million and a couple of years and they cleaned that up and he said you know we did it there we can do it here and so we really felt like we had the ability um, to do this we're a small organization i think at the time we were probably four paid part-time staff <laughs> and a board of, of five or six um, but we felt confident that the community was uh, behind us and so we came up with a plan and this kind of it's a, not a great picture we're working on creating something better Okay, I'm going to just try to talk loud. I don't even know where it, I am looking. Okay, so here is the 17th Street Bridge. Oh, here sorry. is Locals, or the old house. Mm -hmm. This is the Riverway Walk, and down here is the Air Park. Okay, now I got it. And this is the road that goes to Comox. Mm -hmm. Where's, um, the, hmm? where's the dike through? The, the dike the road? Just the wall? The wall. the wall is here. Yeah. Right yeah. So this is how it might look in the future. So what we would do is we will um, we have to take away that wall. Well, that would be the last thing. But eventually, this would be part of the stream side here, and everywhere that's blue would be underwater at certain tidal heights. Um, you can see there's an island here, and then you can maybe see that that's a lower area. I think if you if you switch the slide, I've got another angle. Yeah. So you can see it here. So you have this low area. So at lower high, at lower tidal heights, there's still water here. So if fish need a place to stay. They have this deeper water here that'll stay cooler and um, give them habitat. And then at higher tides, all of this, the, the water will just slowly go up as the tide rises and this will be a high tide. And then along the road, because flooding is an issue in this area, we've got, we propose a, a berm. So we're gonna build a five or six foot high berm that goes along the road and protects the road. Um, and in this, all this area, the brown area will be planted our trees and shrubs. And then in this area here, um, that is kind of going into uh, below the tide line, we're, think we're planting salt marsh grasses. So those marsh grasses, which as I mentioned, are great at sucking up carbon. Okay, next slide. And that's basically what we want it to look like. So when you're driving by the, the area, you drive by the nasty area that's now we've taken all the concrete off. It's just kind of dirt. And then you get to that next area, which is the Hollyhock Flats area. And that's what we're using as our blueprint. And so that will hopefully be what the area looks like when we're finished. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And this is just to show you again, like when you have a natural riparian habitat, um, this, is, this is what you get. You know, at the nearest the water, you get your, your sedges and rushes and those salt marsh plants. And then you kind of go up in height and get your um, willows and shrubs and trees all the way back to your, your conifers at the back. So that, that's the same idea that we're planting here. Next. And there's just another look at uh, the, the dike slough area. So that's the dike slough right now. And uh, that's the, the trees that are current, currently existing in the Hollyhock Flats area. Next slide. Yep, just some more beautiful pictures of salt marsh. <laughs> it can be also beautiful. Um, and there's our, our, some of our native bushes. Next one. And of course, some of our trees. And keep going. 
And then, so we began, so we bought, the, we were, it took us a long time to buy the property. We started in 2017. We had to raise over $3 million to purchase the property. And we finally did that in 2021, no, 2020. So in November, 2020, we completed the purchase of the property and it, it came back, came into our hands. And then we we're really start able to start the restoration. Next slide. And that was kind of what we started with is taking out concrete, mm -hmm. taking out rebar, all the concrete was, there was so much concrete. <laughs> there was way more concrete than we thought there was going to be. We dug, we broke up the first layer of concrete and then under it in a lot of places, there was another layer of concrete and we broke that up. And sometimes there was another layer of concrete. Sometimes it was three layers deep, um, each being about a foot deep and having rebar um, passing all the way through it. So it was quite a deal to extract it all. In fact, we didn't get it all done over the summer last year, which we thought we would. And we finished it up this year. Our next slide. So uh, yeah, that was a lot of la last year, if you're here. Um, some of the people who live on the, the, or work at the old hall house got a lot of banging because that's what it was just, I was on site a lot for a lot of this and it was just a lot of breaking up of concrete. Next slide. Yep. That was quiet. You can keep going. Yeah, so there's a lot of concrete on the site. We took off 700 truck, truck and pop loads of concrete. 40, about approximately 40 bins of metal. And everything that we took off the site has been recycled. Um, and then we put all the money that we get from recycling back into the project. So the concrete was crushed into three inch, keep going in. Oh, oh, here's this a little video. Just so you can really get immersed <laughs> in what it felt like. Uh, this whole area here, so we're trying to return it to what it formerly looked like. So I was just looking at it and it didn't have any marks. 1.5 meters, you're good. Our local community actually purchased it and took it away for us and they used it for road base or to build buildings on. So that was excellent. All that money went back into the project. All the rebar got recycled. Uh, this whole area here, so we're trying to return it to what it formerly looked like. I don't have this on a loop. <laughs> okay. So it was a big deal. Uh, it was a lot of concrete. Because it was so dry last year, dust suppression was a big deal. Um, we had a lot of that banging, you can imagine, created a lot of dust. And so we had to be using walks. So we had to have a person on site um, watering the area so that we keep that dust down. Um, and there's all that, the metal that left the site or some of it. Next. Yep, more. This is the crushing into the three inch minus so it can be trucked off site. And there, there's trucks, hundred, we got it. We actually got all rid of it. In a, so you saw the, two, the three long lines we had. Actually all those 700 trucks, I think it took a week to get it all off the site. So once people started coming up, it went really quickly. We were a bit worried, but it all worked out well. And not just that, so we also had other things that came out of the ground and we've been able to recycle them as well. So people um, like Cumberland Trail System, uh, they have used a lot of the pipes to go uh, as drainage under trails, um, especially for the biking. And then people, you know, apparently um, those are used for decoration. So <laughs> Next thing. another thing that we had to do because so um, this project, as I mentioned, is a reconciliation as well as restoration. So when we're complete, when this project is complete, we're handing it over to Comox First Nation in partnership with the city of Courtney. So this area, it's named Kuskusum, and that is because there was a village uh, it basically where the air park is now used to be the village called Kuskusum or Kuhusam. And um, they had on this side of the river uh, tree burials in this area. And so those are the when they had the pole up and then the platform and the dead on top. And so it was a, a really important area for the community. And um, so we've been working with the Comox First Nation the whole time we've been doing this. They're helping us um, fundraise for it. They come out and do the archeological monitoring. Because of that influence, there might be things left on site that we might dig up, not at the surface so much, but as we get lower, we might find bones uh, or middens or something. So we have to have them on site and they're working with us to, to monitor that as well as all the arch um, environmental things. So we've been working with them very closely, they will be the owners of the site when we're finished with the city of Courtney. And the hope is over time, they'll gain the capacity to own it full out and it will be a part of the Comox First Nation. So in our, we, we feel as a reconciliation in action. 
And we've had tons of people um, supporting the project. We also do water quality monitoring. So even though we have that wall there, there could be times when the dirt gets over the top, something falls over and creates um, a mess in the river. And so we're continually monitoring that. And if there is, um, if there was say a spike, then we do whatever we can to mitigate that from happening. And, and again, and now the, the, the person who came out every day. So every day they come and monitor above the site, at the site and below the site. So we can pinpoint where the problem was, if there was a problem. We also had to, because we took, so last year we took all that concrete off and now we have an open site and we got lots of rain. We're still getting lots of rain. So we needed to mitigate all that, um, any erosion that might happen on the site into the water. And so we put these silt fences up. And so the yellow one there, it floats. And when the tide goes up, uh, when there's high water levels, it will be up and it will allow water through, but stop the silt. And so it will remain on the site. And the other one, the black one on the other side, same idea, except for it's stationary. So we're, and there's the, so behind the wall, we found another wall. Actually, there's three walls. There's the steel wall, there was a concrete wall, and then a wood wall. And you can imagine as they grew, they, you know, first they built the rib wall or some, kind of like cribbing to keep the banks together. And then as they grew and needed more dirt in behind it, they built a, a concrete wall. It took us five days just to get this out. It was quite intense. Um, the wall, as you can see, all the rebar and uh, braided wire was tied to logs. So it's quite a, a deal to, to extract it. But it, it, we did get rid of that this year in February. Um, so it's gone and all that's left is that back wall and we'll, we'll keep that wall because it's protecting the river. While we do all our restoration on the site, dig it up, make a mess, it keeps the river, the any erosion going into the, the river, which would affect salmon and other fish and wildlife. Oh, and there's a picture of, of them trying to work at the wall. The back machine can't actually get wet. So we had pumps and we had to suck out water while we were working at, at this wall. Next. And there's a lot of the stuff that came out of the wall. A lot of the guys were saying that it's really unfortunate. Like these are yellow cedar logs and there's some of them are quite huge, but they're all waterlogged and they're full of dirt and rocks. Um, but at the time, and at the time they would have been, you know, almost waste wood. And today we're like, oh, that's so beautiful. It's so large, all that, all that timber. But it, it's, you know, um, so people did, so, I mean, we still try, some people have been using this to, um, I mean, some of it was full of creosote and we had to deal with that, but uh, other pieces people took to use for garden borders and stuff. So really trying to utilize everything that came off the site. And this year, so we got it all done, we got the top off, and now we're going to start more of the exciting part. Um, we did a, a pilot plant at the north end of the site nearest to the traffic lights. If you look over, you'll see it. Um, we put in 400 plants. Yay. It's which is great, but you'll see how big it looks. Right? <laughs> Next, I think I actually have a little. Um, so, so what we're doing now, what we're so over the summer, what we're going to be doing is recontouring the site. So, a natural stream site doesn't look like this, it of course looks like this, it's sloped. So, we're going to be digging out all this material and shipping it off site. Some of it will go into the berm that we're building, but most of it will have to go off site. We'll be testing every part, every not every truckload, but every area. Um, to see if there's contamination. They did take it up to a certain level when they went to sell it, they had to. Um, so we, we know there's not, and we've been testing along all the time. We know there's not a lot of contamination there, but just to be double sure, we're going to be testing um, every area. If, it's, if there is contamination, it goes to Campbell River and they will deal with it there. If it's clean soil, then it'll go to probably Browns River. Um, they have a, a soil area that, that we could put it at. But basically, we're going to recontour the site so that's that, that picture I showed you with the deep pool and, and the island and, and the salt marsh area. <clears throat> Next slide. And then when we're finally done all that, um, we're going to take out the wall. And so what we're going to have to do to take out the wall, because we won't want to put big machinery over our newly planted area, um, we're going to, so we'll take out the, the dirt this fall, we'll be planting. If anyone's keen at planting, um, look at our website, September, October, we'll need tons of volunteers. Those 400 plants with such a small area, you can imagine how many plants we're gonna need to put in for the rest of the site. It's gonna be quite a lot. So um, keep an eye on our website, we'll be needing all the volunteers we can get. 
But once we're done, oh, sorry, back again. Once we're done that, probably in 2024, we're going to start removing the wall. So the plants will have some time to settle in and we'll have a barge come up the site and come up the river and wiggle, um, wiggle, vibrate the pieces of uh, steel out of the ground. Um, and that will be the end of the project. Once we're done that, that'll be the restoration complete, which we picture will be 2024. And after that, we'll just be looking at maintaining the project and maintaining the plantings. Um, yes. Yeah. So it's pretty exciting. Um, we're going to get a lot done this year. We might not, as you all know, gas prices have gone up. So getting all that soil off site might not be feasible this year. We might only get three quarters of that done and then finish that up next year once we've written more grant proposals, which takes me to this side. We are about, oh, I need to change that. We're about 75% raised for the restoration. So we still have about 25% to go, which is, you know, one and a half million dollars, nothing. <laughs> I mean, we've we raised three million, three and a half million to buy it. And we've raised a couple, a couple million more. And so what we've got left is about one and a half to two million, we figure. It'll all depend on gas prices and how much contamination, et cetera. But uh, it's, a, it's a range. So we're still writing grants. We're still um, running events in our community. Uh, we're still accepting donations. Um, and that's to bring us up to that completion point, hopefully in 2024. Next slide. This is one of the ways that you've probably all driven by and seen the salmon. And uh, I'm actually painting salmon with Tamiko's class next week. Um, so this is part of an education program. We bring kids, we tell them about the estuary, the Cusco Sun site, why it's so important. They come out and do some actual interactive uh, activities um, right in, the, sometimes at Cusco Sun, sometimes at the air park. And then the last step is we go back to the classroom and, and they paint salmon. And then people can donate $25 and we'll put the salmon up on the wall. Yes. And we've, it's been a great success. We have over 300 salmon up right now, and we're hoping to get, you know, maybe the rest of the wall done um, this year and next year. And check the CDUF website. Our salmon's up there too. Yep. Yes. I was out there with Barb and, and if you were there, right? Yeah. Barb and Heather helped me put the, your salmon up as well. Fire hydrants. Fire hydrants. Fire hydrants. <laughs> okay, so these are pictures of other you know, lots of businesses in our community have supported this project, which were really, which is really awesome. Next slide. And of course, we've had tons of other donors. Um, the, the province of BC has chipped in quite a lot. So to buy the property, they, they put in $1.6 million. And then they're through different departments funding its restoration, along with uh, the other funders you see up here. Next slide. Okay, if there's any questions, uh, let me know. Yes. Will that fencing where the salmon are, are fastened on, will that stay? That will definitely stay for a while. Definitely till the end of 2024. And yeah. then after that, we'll see, um, we're working on whether or not we can do a bike lane and how that would work in that area. And I don't know if that would mean move the fence, but it will definitely be up until the end of 2024. Okay. And then if it does ever come down, um, we can always take the salmon down, put them up on the site somewhere. Yeah. Don't want to lose no. You mentioned that there was human habitation across the river. Is there any evidence that there was ever human habitation where the site is? Not that we have, no. And the, yeah, not that we know of. So, but on this, where am I? Oh, yeah, not a good map for that, but yeah, so Air Park was the one that we knew about, and it was documented in. Um, settlement. So that when people came and settled this area, um, there's a written document where people were going up the river and they talk about seeing the village and then also seeing the poles on the other side, on the Cuscus side. And we don't know exactly where those poles, what poles were. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, is there a way we could donate particular trees? Um, is that already established what's going on? Um, so we have a planting prescription which lays out what kind of things will go in what area, and we because we haven't got to that yet, um, most of the planting we haven't. Um, we did start with that, but it seemed maybe too early. Like you said, you can sponsor salt marsh for this much, and you can sponsor uh, trees and shrubs for this much. Um, but I think it was too early. It was not well adopted. So. This year, probably as we get further on, we will be we might be offering it's one of our ideas to offer sponsors the, the ability to sponsor different um, plants that we will be planting there. Great. So that's something that uh, you can look out for on our website. <laughs> yes. Where do you get the planting stock from? Oh, 
good question. So streamside native plants that look, gives us a lot of um, plants. So there's a, they're out by, I think, Bowser. And uh, so they, we let them know we're good ahead of time because we're going to need a lot of plants. Um, we've got a couple other distributors and people locally who, who um, grow native plants and who are growing for us as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a big deal getting all those plants at the right time. Have you considered including a footpath along the top of the berm? So yes, we have. Um, we are not going to be owners of this property, and we're not landowners anyways. It was never our desire to own this piece of land. It was our desire to restore it. Um, so the Comox First Nation and the City of Courtney will really have to decide how what the public use access will be once they own it. So we can't say for sure, but we are working with them towards things like uh, having, especially for education, um, access. Um, there is a small area right near the gate that we can enter the site that has been left with concrete so that we could have a parking area um, and maybe a viewing station. We don't want to have tons of people on the site and the idea is for fish and wildlife and it will be very mucky. It's a very wet site, so you probably don't want to be walking around there too much anyways. But there would be, we're working with the Palmas First Nation and the city of Courtney to see, you know, with legality and um, maintenance requirements, what makes sense for them going into the future. Yeah. Um, is there a danger if there's major flooding that uh, the ecology and the uh, restoration will be and uh, So we're now asked if there was a major flood on the site, um, could that negatively impact our new rest restored area. And there is always that possibility with any restoration you do next to water for there to be, um, whether it's a storm or like when we do our coastal restoration uh, projects, um, there is that there is a risk, but there will be step, steps that will be taken to minimize that risk. So um, the plants that we're putting in grow very fast. Um, their roots are meant for this kind of habitat. Um, we won't be taking the wall away until they've had about a year to establish themselves. So all these things, all these factors should help, but there is the possibility that there could be a blowout, and so that's why we'll be continuing to monitor the, the site over time. And if there are, and there will be, you know, there will be some percentage of success, and there will be some some plants that don't make it, and so we'll be monitoring that and plant replanting um, in areas that need replanting over time. And, and just when we, how we design them, we've got engineers working on how the, 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 I, the area will be designed and the design will also help. Like there's a, there is a little bit of rocky armoring. So we're not taking all the wall away actually, right beside the wall, the bridge, we're leaving a section of wall um, just because <laughs> we figure that's smart. It's not supposed to be tied into the integrity of the bridge, but we don't want to risk it. And there's no reason not to leave a small area. So that area will remain um, the steel wall. And then when it comes into the site, that area there, there will be a special kind of armor, well, not, not armoring, we don't like armoring, <laughs> but um, protection so that, that it doesn't scour out. Um, and same at the far end of the site, there will be another uh, rocky area that will help the same idea, um, protecting the sewage pipe uh, and those sewage pump pumps with the sewage line that goes across. And so we'll have some, some um, rock area there to help um, stabilize that, those banks as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Any other questions? Very nice. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, I go out and tell everybody. Yes. <laughs> thank you. That's a great website. <laughs> so the website is listed here um, as well, and it's pretty easy to follow. And we will put it in the communicator for the coming weeks so that you can um, find it easily. Um, if today you have any um, financial gifts that you'd like to share, where did we put the basket? Is I don't know. Behind you, right behind you. Oh, this has got stones. That's got stones. This one oh. on the bed. Oh, okay. You need one on the bed. Okay, thanks for that. And 
Yeah. Renan's good. Oh, okay. And um, you can always, a lot of people have arranged to do things automatically from the bank. And so we appreciate that for very various means. And I will not go through them all because I will mess them up. And, um, but when you do donate to the to uh, CDUF, indicate whether it's for our um, general fund to keep us having meetings like this, or for Karen Concerns Discretionary Fund, which is for people within the community who have specific needs, or whether it's for our Transforming Our World recipient, who has been the caravan um, for uh, the Comox Valley, so that provides free mental health and physical and dental care for people. So. Is that going to be in the June, that caravan? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, it is through June. Yeah. Yeah. Has changed, has yeah. yeah, so thank you for all your gifts and you know, your attention and um, generous generosity. Okay, Marvin. A reading for Chalice Singerson comes from the Reverend Teresa Soto, who I believe is a UU minister in Oakland. Mask off, please, ma'am. Get the mask off. Reverend, mask off, please. Mask off. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks. Got in the hearing aid. Yeah. Can't do that. Uh, getting rid of the hearing aid. I know that's scenario. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> We've been through that. And if you time, only so. have one arm, it's really hard to put it in again. Yeah. <laughs> and if you have an earring on, oh, um, glasses. Our hope is not indefinite. It does not come magically from inside each of us, nor does it exist for ourselves alone. Hope is a practice that we create. Just as mastering physical skills takes a lot of training and practice, mastering communal hope requires that we stay with it and do the actions that will bring about new states of being and new futures. If we use a phrase like, we are in, a, in this together, it means that we choose each other over and over and over as sources and communities of hope. Maybe we'll repeat it often. Changing our reality often takes more than one try. We're in this together. Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank you for being here. At the end of our services, we have a tradition of forming a circle. Uh, we used to hold hands before COVID, but um, you can just form a circle, connect spiritually with the person next to you, and then we will sing and sign um, during the play. Yes. I can't get it off my slide. <laughs> no, I can't get it off my slide. You have to wing it, people. <laughs> Carry the wing. Until we meet again, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Do our last part that we in the
Christy was part of it. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I saw that. And I saw, oh, so you can see. Yeah, I saw that that was I thought about this. Move to so move to Merkel. I started the society. I feel like it was I just do a You can shut it down if you want, Heather. You can shut it down if you want to go. Okie doke. Good to have you here. Yeah, love you. Take care out there. Yeah. 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 Yeah.